Yeah, I like that. Because I, if I'm not, I just don't use it. That's nobody's fault. It's just I just I will be alive. So there was one there was one that said no bell pepper food. I know that's me, so I took it. <laughs> I'm going to kind of just move in here and move off and just stand here. You realize that was you. Hi. <laughs> okay, we'll get started. <laughs> Hello? Can you hear me? Clap once. <laughs> ah, thanks for humoring me. <laughs> That's all teacher trick. Okay, I am going to get started with two announcements um, as I have your increased undivided attention. 
Um, the first one is there was a ton of food left over from lunch. So please, please do take some with you. Find some people to give it to, eat it later, put it in your fridge, whatever you want to do. Um, that was the first one. And the second one is lost your phone. We have one at Coat Check. <laughs> okay. Back on that. Um, on behalf of the 2023 Inclusive SciComm Symposium Planning Committee, which I was having the privilege of being a part of, my name's Evel, by the way, um, uh, and the Metcalf Institute, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to today's keynote lecture by John Bear Mitchell. The Inclusive SciComm Symposium is hosted by the University of Rhode Island Metcalf Institute, which occupies the land of the Narragansett Nation and the Niantic people. We honor and respect the enduring and continuing relationship between indigenous people and this land by teaching and learning more about their history and present day communities and by becoming stewards of the land we too inhabit. Before transitioning into introducing our keynote today, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and express gratitude to a common source of light for the attendees of the symposium, sunshine. Thank you so much for your dedication and leadership and for all the vision that you help us develop together and shaping the future of inclusive science communication. It has been a true pleasure to work with you on the planning committee over these past few months and witness your patience, grace, and careful and so thoughtfulness um, about our collective work. Um, please join me in thanking Sunshine. And with our sights set on the future, we hope that you'll join us later at the town hall later this evening to continue co-conspiring the future of inclusive SciComm movement together. The future leaders of this movement are in this room right now. And I hope that we can take full advantage of our time here together. Hmm. Okay. Now, today's keynote speaker beautifully illustrates two of the uh, themes of this year's symposium, language matters and building trust and relationships. We gratefully acknowledge doot, the Rita Allen Foundation for supporting this year's keynote talks. Storytelling is a way to connect people. Connect with people in the present by sharing something deep and meaningful to you. Connecting to the past when you transmit history passed down generation to generation. And building a future where we are tethered to each other and the earth. It amplifies our way of understanding phenomenon and the natural world around us. It's also a way to build trust, as our next speaker will show us, as we know that the science communication field is in dire need of this. <clears throat> John Bear Mitchell is a citizen of the Penobscot Nation from Indian Island in Maine. He presently serves as the University of Maine System Office Native American Waiver Educational Program Coordinator, University of Maine's one of Wanabanaki Center, Outreach and Student Development Coordinator, as well as Lecturer of Wabaganaki Studies and Multicultural Studies at the University of Maine in Orono. He has served on numerous museum boards and educational boards throughout the state with mission based on Maine's Wanabanaki people. John's research centers around the history of Native Americans in higher education. He also speaks about tribal ecological knowledge in regards to the traditional use of natural methods of surviving in cooperation with the natural world. For 15 years, 15 years, John has visited schools in Maine as a Maine touring artist delivering arts and education program. During that time, he's visited over 150 schools. While working his way through college, he toured with the Native American storytellers of New England. He presented program a traditional and contemporary program at the Native American Stories and Song. His singing and storytelling can be heard in many main PBS tribal-sponsored awareness films, independent film, HBO Lionsgate TV, and many documentaries with topics on Maine's Native people. Please join me in welcoming John. Get that coughing out of the way. I'm sorry. Great. 
Welcome. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Narragansett Nation and the Niantic people. And I want to welcome myself on behalf of my tribe, the Penobscot Nation, which sits in the middle of the, <coughs> excuse me, Penobscot River in the middle of well, Penobscot County in Maine. And um, I welcome myself here on behalf of myself and my chief, who I spoke with previous to coming here. So I recognize that I'm on their land. And with that, I, I express my gratitude. Kachimu and Muswal Nataliwe, Skijinawadu, Ranawap Skijin Iljaya, Ijibolida Haram Ali Skijinawi, Adadil Nabamuk, Mui, Nagakakagus, Ijibolida Haram Gizi Skijinawadwi. My name and my language is Kachimu and Muswal. I come from an island that sits in a river where the rocks stick out of the water. And I'm proud that our language still exists in our community and is taught in our schools. And my family comes from the Bear Clan and the Crow Clan, although we're matriarchal, my primary clan is Crow. My secondary clan is Bear. And I'm proud of who I am, although I was luckily born as who I am in, in my tribe and in my family. I, I offer acknowledgement of that privilege to the creator. Basically, that's what I said in my language, loosely translated into English. I want to talk about um, a, the first storyteller. So these slides that are here today for you are just sort of an outline for you to kind of understand at least where I'm going with this. They're not the story itself. The story is going to be filled in. The gaps will be flooded and, uh, and, and leveled. But I really want to talk about the message. This story that I'm telling you today was not a story that we can write, although I've told it several times and people have written it. It's not a story that we can write. It's a story that's strictly supposed to be told. And it's supposed to be told for one reason is because it tries to help understand where we need to be and what we do and how we communicate and our obligation to that communication. His name was Chibalok. He was the first storyteller. There's always got to be a first. He was our first storyteller. And in Maine, if you know anything about Maine, there was obviously somebody who tried a lobster. <laughs> Let's Let's eat that spider. And everybody else just watched and they said it was good. And so the white people came and it was good. And, <laughs> and so that's good. But uh, we never really ate lobster as a, as a food source, like as a primary food source. But it was more of a fertilizer we used in our gardens traditionally later on. Like my mother really likes it, so she eats it. So Chibalok was our first storyteller. He was the keeper of the stories, but being the keeper of something doesn't mean you own it. It means you hold it for others. He didn't understand that really initially. He didn't understand his role as keeper of the stories was to hold those stories for other people to learn. It took him a long time to really understand what that communication meant. Well, all these stories that he had Tell the knowledge of our people, our territory. Why does that animal look like that? Why is that hill there? How did this river get here? They're our best explanation at the time. There was our ideology. There was our best way of knowing our indigenous knowledge. It was what we knew. They became our scientists, those people that heard those stories, who understood that connection that we had. So Chibalok told stories for so long. He told stories to little children who grew up and had children of their own, who grew up and had children of their own, who grew up and had children of their own. You see, because in our community, he was the man that forgot to die. He forgot to go to what we call the other side of camp because he held such 
an importance in his mind for what he did, that nobody else could do this as well as I did. Nobody else can communicate this like me. I'm the one who holds these stories. I teach you all this because I have this knowledge. And even though people have heard these stories time and time again, generation after generation, Shabalak really never let them go. He owned them to the point where people accepted that he's the communicator of this and we're the recipients of this information. Inadvertently, that really confined that knowledge. Shabalak was an interesting guy, tall and lean. And he had his family and his family had all passed on. So he had the descendants of his family, his great-grandchildren, his great-great-grandchildren. He knew them all, but he wanted to keep separate. So he always stayed back in the village. How we say house in my language literally is wigwam, means house. There's different styles of them, but he had his wigwam down over the side of this hill, off to the side of the village where nobody could really see him. Obviously people are walking back and forth, surrounded by pines on a nice bed of pine needles. He knew that pine trees give off heat. He liked the heat. And so he stayed there as much as he could, which was pretty much all the time. Not every time, but all the time. Sometimes they'd move around a little bit, depending. But these villages were sedentary. So Chibalok had this log. It was a stump, really. It was a tree that had fallen over, and he kind of figured out that if he sits back against it, he can put his butt on it and his feet would dig down into the ground. And that was where he told his stories from every single morning that there was the possibility of telling stories. So if it wasn't too rainy and knew it was going to get people, if it wasn't too snowy or cold, or if it wasn't too hot, he would be standing there. People would come in the mornings to listen to him. It was even among the children, a bet or a dare to get awake and grab some food and get down on that little hill to hear Shavalok tell a story before he got up. They were never successful. He was old. He had nothing to do. He went to bed right after supper and woke up before anything else woke up. And he was ready to go. And so Chibalok would lean up against that log and dig his heels in. He'd wait for some people to come around and, and he'd tell the stories. Whatever he felt moved him at that point. Again, generation after generation. There was a time when Shabalak got homesick. He was homesick in his own home. We don't understand that as young people. Look around this room, I don't see many elders. I see elder knowledge. I don't see many elders. Why is that? Because they're chilling. It's their time to rest. And this elder knowledge existed, again, for our benefit. Well, imagine living in the same place you have lived since you were born and becoming old and realizing that you're homesick in your own home where you spent your life. And take that message and understanding about how our elders must feel and take that with you. That's a message for all of us. He was homesick. He was tired. He was depressed. He really had to do a lot of thinking. What am I gonna do? The young ones don't come to me anymore for information. There's no buddy my age to talk to anymore to confirm what I know, to really have a conversation about why it's this way. I'm on my own with all this knowledge that can benefit the community, that can benefit other communities along the way and the tribe and the confederation of tribes in its entirety is not being sought out anymore. What do I do? 
He knew there was a decision he had to make. One morning, beautiful morning, a typical morning where generations of people had come down to hear him tell a story. They had gone down to this place and there in front of them was a log and two indentations where Chabellock's feet would always dig into the ground. He laughed at his own jokes. And when he did that, his feet would dig in further. They were there, but he wasn't standing in them. I mean, you can't gain knowledge from empty footprints. What are we going to do, they said. What's going to happen? Chabellock is not here anymore. They looked at his lodge house, and the flap was still closed. Oh no, what's, what, what's gonna happen if we go to open that door? Well, for one thing, they knew that if he was still breathing, they were in trouble. But if he wasn't, what would they do? Most of the people that were around were younger people, children. I think the oldest one was like 14 years old, it was a boy. And they started talking, what are we gonna do? You know, the adults are gonna start coming down here in a little bit. What are we gonna say to them? They're gonna wonder why we didn't take control. What if Chabalak needs help? Hmm. What should we do? Well, they figured out what they need to do was go open that door, but none of them dared to, but the youngest, boy was really, really scared. And the youngest girl was really nervous. And the older boy who was about 14 said, you know, I can't let these children, these younger ones open that door. And if Chabellock decided to go to the other side of camp last night, they'd find him. And that would be kind of traumatic for them. So I'll go down, you guys sit here, I'll go down, I'll knock on the door. And they said, you're so brave. He said, I'm not really. All I know is I can run faster than him. That's all I need. So he went down and boom, 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 bounded on the side of the door. And he listened. He heard nothing. Not a rustling inside. No movement. He looked at his friends up there and they had their hands towards their mouths. They themselves were nervous for him. They were ready to run with him if need be. Boom, 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 he's pounded on the side of that door again. And he heard some movement in there at that point. What do you want? Who's out there? The boy said his name. Chabellock said, Gus, Shkwe, Abin, hey son, come in and sit down. So he looked back, all the kids were sitting there and he put his hand up. I'll come right back in a minute. He opened that flap and he went in. Directly behind that door, straight in, Chabellock had his bed pegs in the ground with sticks going across those. So he wasn't laying on the cold ground, a little bit above. But he was laying there just chilling out, hanging. And the boy sat down and he said, Grandfather, why aren't you out telling stories today? Nobody has ever seen this. You, we're happy you're okay, but you're going to come out and tell stories. And grandfather said, you know, I have a thing that I've been thinking about. And that is that I think I have a very important message I want everybody to hear. And I stayed here today because I really wanted you to come in, somebody to come in, it was you. I wanted to see if people did worry about me. I wanted to see if I was just putting myself out there and valuing myself more than anybody else was. And I'm really happy you came in. I didn't answer you right off because I like to scare you a little bit. I knew what you were thinking, but uh, you're here. I want you to leave. Vilos, I want you to go. And I want you to go tell everybody in the community that I have a very important message tomorrow that I need to bring. 
And it's a very important message. It's for everybody to hear. So I want this hill in front of me full of people. And those who can't come, everybody that comes, everybody that agrees to come, to hear me tell this very important message tomorrow, needs to be able to communicate it to another person. Don't show up if you don't want to. You're not here just to listen. You're here to pass on what I say. Tell everybody that. Go out now. Bilos, get out of here. Go tell everybody what I said. Be here in the morning. So the boy left. Did as he was told. Put the message out. The message spread and spread. People worked quieter that day as they were smoking the fish and the meat. They were preparing for the winter, right in the middle of summer. And they were fixing nets, repairing canoes, making clothes, doing their normal everyday chores that they needed to do. They worked quieter that day. What's the message? What's he going to say? What do we need to know? Are we in trouble? What's going to happen? Well, the next morning, people came early, very early, even before the sun came up. But guess who was there? Spalak was already waiting. Many people said, ah, he was probably sitting there since the sun went down, just for that reason. But nobody really could confirm that. Everybody was there in front of him. In fact, so many people came, they were sitting in front of him here. They were behind him. No matter where he looked, Shabala could not see any ground at all. It was covered with people everywhere around him. This was incredible. He had never had people like this show up. And they were all sitting there in anticipation. What's his story? Well, Shabala, finally, he said, I'm going to start. And what I have to tell you is my final story. And he told his final story. You guys want to hear it? Okay, I'll be telling it later on. Um, JK, LOL. Um, all right, so, so um, this was his final story. He said, you know, Mosawinawuk, you know my people. He said, it's very important for me to leave you. Because I have not given you permission explicitly to tell the stories of our people. I didn't say don't tell them, but I also put out the image that I'm the only teller of these stories. I'm the keeper of these stories. And he said, and this is not the way it should be. This is not the way it was meant to be. I was put on this earth to be just the communicator of them, to teach all you, everybody sitting here, children and elders and everybody in between alike. They're all supposed to be telling these stories. That's our history. That's our science. That's about your family and your clans and your people. And it's extremely important that we all know these stories. Because if we don't know our story and we don't tell our story, then we'll never know about the people of the past. We'll never know how we explain things. We'll never know our ancestors' beliefs and what put their thoughts together because we will have skipped all that and made it about us. And I think I did that. I think I made all this important stuff about me. I am the storyteller. I'm the keeper of this knowledge. I'm the important one. When actually what I am is just the facilitator. I am just the catalyst. 
And I was thinking, how could I stop this? Well, I know now. And I know that I need to tell you to all tell the stories. You all need to speak these truths. This knowledge is for everybody. This knowledge is ancient. This all knowledge is new. This knowledge could have been born yesterday. But it's your job now to tell those stories. And he said, I want you to think of it like this. Stories are like fireflies or lightning bugs all through this place. You can't see them because I've blinded you from seeing them. But they exist. Little lights above everybody's head. Flickering. Some bright. Hard to look at. Some dim. Almost going out. Almost extinguished. Every one of those lights is a story. Those bright ones are stories that are told over and over again and given energy, given life, and they burn so bright. But those ones are my favorite. And sometimes my favorite are not what's important necessarily for our survival, for our knowledge, for our sake of well-being and carrying on. Those ones that are mediumly lit, they're told once in a while. They're not going to go out yet. They're not going to extinguish, but they're not going to get brighter. They'll become those dim, almost out lights that exist above your heads. And when those ones extinguish, when they fail to give off any light ever again, those stories are lost forever. Never to be remembered, never to be resurrected, never to be even given a little more life. They will be forgotten because when they go out, they are forgotten. There's so much of our history. There's so much of our knowledge as indigenous people, as Wabanaki, as people of the first light that don't exist anymore. Because we forgot me forgot to tell them because I got caught up in this one or I got caught up in that one. And nobody else here told those stories to give them brightness again either. Instead, they were just forgotten. So I realized what I have to do. I have to leave. I have to go. And that's the only way you're going to be empowered to carry on this message. That's the only way that you can take it and make it something relevant to who you are. Because yes, I'm a modern day person existing today in this modern day world, he says. But my mindset and my thoughts are ancient. You're new. You can offer new life to these stories. Now it's your responsibility. You, you and you and you, you. It's your responsibility to tell these stories. Every time you tell a story, it's going to have new light. It's going to get a little brighter. It's not going to be bright, bright. It's going to have a little more luminescence to it because you're going to tell it. Keep it bright, he says. Keep it bright. Keep that information going. Keep that knowledge there for everybody to see and everybody to know about. How? You say you're not a storyteller, you are a storyteller. If you can tell the story of yourself, that's a good start. He says, hear your story. Hear your story through your mind. Hear your family story. What do you know about it? What do you think about it? And hear other family members tell the stories. Hear it. It's important. 
hear the stories from anyone that will tell them. And then he says, tell your story. He says, tell your family story. Tell the stories to your family. That's always fun. And tell your stories to anyone that will listen. You have to hear them before you can tell them. You have to hear how other people tell them before you can tell them the way you want to tell them. Now, he said, do not try to replicate how somebody else tells a story. We all have our own way of telling the story. Tell it your way. Tell it with humor. Tell it with sincerity and seriousness, if need be. Tell it the way you tell it. Become a storyteller. Learn them. Know them. Understand them. That is important. And Shabalak said, my message is now out to you people. My young, my old, my in-betweens. You have it now. You have the knowledge of the stories I tell and the stories I've told. And you've created your own, but sometimes you don't tell them as a story. But tell them as a story. That's important. Tell the stories that we all know about why those trees are there. Why those leaves fall off in the fall time and why they come back in the summer, spring. Tell the stories of the creation of our river and our oceans and shorelines and why the wind blows and why the rain falls. Tell the story about the snow. Why does it come? Tell the stories about when we used to live on the ice. Tell the stories about living on the ground after the ice went out. Tell all those stories. Now it's on you. Keep it bright. And with that, Chibalak put his arms out to his side, and he started to become translucent. And it looked like he started to rise off the ground. He said, I'm leaving you. Although his voice was steady, his physical appearance was not. He became a shadow. He floated away. He said, my name is Chibalak. He said, and if you have a question for me, I'll still be available for you to answer. But do it as a prayer. Do it as a message in your mind if you need help with something. But it's okay to talk to me and not ask for something. It's okay to go to bed at night and say, thank you. To me, Tux, Ginny West, the creator of all. Thank you for letting me go to bed tonight, for giving me this day. And then in the morning... Willy Wun Chimitux. Creator, thank you for letting me wake up today to have another day. It's okay to say that. It's okay not to ask for something. But if you do ask me for something, I'll come to you in your dreams. And I will deliver the message in my talons. I will fly in. I will offer you the message if you take it. You'll have your answer. Sometimes you won't know that answer for a while, but you'll have it. If you don't take it, if you turn your head from me because you flinch or you're scared, it will be a long time before, or if ever, I bring you that message again. So always accept it as you ask for it. You can question it. You can break it apart. You can try to understand it and its meaning and how it applies to you in that situation. But take it. Now it's up to you, he says. Keep the story strong. Keep that knowledge flow going. You younger ones, sit down with your elders, he says as he's floating away and disappearing into the sky. Learn from them. Some of them will answer your questions. They'll have the answer. They'll have the knowledge. Some will not give the answers because you haven't asked them. 
You literally have to sit down with them. You literally have to ask them. Offer them something. Offer them something to hold on to, to, to eat, to drink. Offer them something. Make that connection with them. But also understand that some will not be able to answer your questions because they'll have forgotten the answers because they relied too much on the messenger to hold that knowledge to the point where they didn't hold it anymore. They let it go. That's the sad part. When we become dependent on others to hold that information and we feel we don't have to retain it because we're not gonna have to communicate it because it's held in a certain place. And we can always go back there. In this case, you can't. And therefore they will have forgotten. Whoops. Sorry. Stories. They're important. They help communicate, right? They're everything here. There's no part of a story that's not based on something experiential. There's no part of a story that's unimportant. But there are important parts of the story we need to hold on to. And we need to not hear the stories through our mind. We need to hear the stories through our hearts. In other words, feel the stories. Become connected to them. Let them drive your emotions. Shbelok left us. The word Shbelok means the spirit of the white eagle, literally. He never knew what his name meant until that day. But we know in a shorter period of time than he ever knew. But he allowed us to know that. That's important. And that's the story of Chibelok and why that is important information for all of us. So thank you for that. And we're going to keep going. But I want to talk a little bit about building trust through the stories. Okay. Now, at this point in time, you can ask questions. Make comments, complaints, share dreams, visions, or hallucinations you might have had during the process. Hallucinations are always fun to share, right? So feel free to do that. But stories build trust, right? They're effective, consistent communication. So like I say here, through storytelling, adults and children interact within the family. With the adults being considered as the teachers and the children as the students, and sometimes the elders are the teachers and the adults are the students, correct? But we gotta give the elders that respect. We have to understand that what they're saying to them is the truth, is important. And listening is important for them, for us. So as much as we want our children and our students to hear us is just as equally as important for our elders wanting their children and adults children to hear them. They still have knowledge. It may be a little bit outdated and it may not be necessary, but give them an ear. It's important that builds and maintains that trust that they are still valued, that they are not cast aside. That now you have the experience, you have the knowledge, you know too, but let them have a voice, please. We're telling a story about the earth, animals and humans and how to have a positive intergenerational interaction with them. You know, we're understanding and interacting with stories. Uh, it fosters a positive relationship, right? It really does. And lastly, while each story is unique, a commonality persists through all through them all. They communicate a symbiotic relationship between nature, humanity, and presence of the divine. That's that understanding, right? 
That's that T-E-K, that traditional ecological knowledge or ecological, wherever you're from. Also that indigenous knowledge way of learning is very important. That's how we know what we know through our elders. That's why we have our language still. Most of Winawuk, uh, Skijinawadu, our people's language. That's really important to understand. That's why we teach that language at the University of Maine in four different sections for anybody Be <laughs> as foreign language credits. Um, because I know. Who else is going to pay for this? People to teach. Um, I know it's ironic. <laughs> Whole song about that. But then again, it builds that trust, right? It builds that relationship, and that's really key. Oh, I guess that was it. Um, so in the last ten-ish, fifteen-ish minutes, if you don't have questions, I teach two and a half hour class. I could keep talking. But I would rather you ask questions um, so that you have, you know, you, you can look at me, even though I'm not maybe an elder to you, maybe I'm an equal, it doesn't matter. Sometimes the knowledge is different than your knowledge. Sometimes the understanding of the clarity is better explained than it is interpreted sometimes. So anybody have any questions? Yes. Okay, so I guess Mike, Pete, go for it. I, and so we'll get to you. Just keep your arm up and we'll go to you. How did you learn about the first storyteller? How did I learn about the first storyteller? That's a great question. Um, so I have gone to uh, ceremonies my whole life, pretty much. Been taken there by uncles and clan mothers and uh, other relatives as a young child. And all of our stories and all of our knowledge is written on these woven belts called wampum belts. And wampum in our language means it's talking. And these belts are made out of a quahog shell with white and purple beads. And they're tubular beads and they're woven like a belt. And so they all have symbols on them. And those who know how to read the wampum belts know that those symbols on the wampum belts are catalysts for stories. And so I had to go listen to those stories and at first I thought it was kind of boring because I go to school, like third grade's bad enough. <laughs> and, um, and I got to go and listen to some elders talk about these wampa belts and tell the stories, but I found them so intriguing. And at one point I went and I heard that story and I loved the story. And over my life until my coming of age ceremony, when I was about 15 years old and I had to do a two day fast in the woods with some other boys that were scattered here and there. And we had to literally pray for two days on our own, keep a fire going. We had nothing, nothing. We had our hands, our minds, a sleeping bag and a little fire. And we had to pray and we had to connect. And um, we came out of that ceremony and one of the elders came down from Big Cove, New Brunswick, and he told that story. I loved it. And I never heard it anywhere else. And then over the course of the next 10, 12 years, I kept hearing the story. When I walked out of that first coming of age ceremony, I was given a white satin shirt with ribbons, like this type of ribbon, ribbon shirt. And I was told that I was going to be a speaker. I was told that I'm going to tell the stories and I'm going to talk about our people. I couldn't talk in front of two or three people. I was so nervous. I was like, this is crazy. They're giving me this white, funky 1970s shirt, you know, and with ribbons on it, groovy and uh, whatever. And so I took the shirt and I brought it home and I hung it in my closet. And then later on in my life, it came out and I had to wear it. And I still have it to this day. And I'm doing that work my elders told me I was going to do. And about the age of 30, I was told that I have permission to tell this story. You cannot tell the story in a traditional way without having permission, without earning that right. Because there's a lot in this story to talk about. And so I was given permission to tell the story, but never to write the story. People do write the story. I have changed characters in the story and scenes, so I know when they're telling my version of it. 
And um, that's not nice, but they do it and I can't stop them. But that's how I learned the story. And I found that the meaning of the story over time was applicable to what I was doing for work through TEK, Tribal Ecological Knowledge Systems. As I was paddling down the river five years in a row, 240 miles, bringing teachers out onto the river and students out onto the rivers in canoes with a group we called the Penobscot River Keepers, I started to realize that I had a intense interest in nature and what nature could offer us. We're always looking from the land to the water. We always observe it as a something else. But when you're on the water and you're looking at the land, there's a whole different perspective of, of the world. And so I started to take that in a different direction and realize that that story is very important to that knowledge and to build that trust. You know, in anything we do, we have to be knowledgeable enough to build trust for those people who are listening to us. And when we stray from that knowledge and diminish that trust, we become less of a communicator. And that's not, not necessarily what we want to do. There was somebody else. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, so my question is about neurodivergence. Right, so I, so there have been um, instances, especially like in religion, you know, they say Moses, when he saw, I think it was Moses, the one that saw the burning bush, uh, was actually experiencing like a psychotic episode. Um, and so I'm curious about the role of people um, that have experiences with psychosis that sometimes people say transcend the self. Like, is, is there more of a truth that comes from these sorts of different ways of seeing the world that maybe we're not thinking about or are dismissing? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that, you know, when we look at sort of these things that we refer to as miracles that are religious texts, you know, Jesus turning like water into wine, which is, you know, wine is 80% water anyway, so it's only a 20% miracle. But, um, um, you know, when we look at things like that, I didn't, I didn't mean it to come out that, but uh, that's a form of psychosis. Um, but um, I'm glad you guys have a sense of humor. Um, but sometimes I'll tell that one in my classes and they're like, what? Uh, but they're freshmen. So um, no, uh, but when we kind of look at sort of this like interest, um, so in order to, to like ex get an experience based on something, right? There are tribes that you do use hallucinogenics like peyote and, and other types of cacti or root systems, root plant root systems that, or mushrooms or things like that, fungus, that do give you sort of like this vision, okay? Because in indigenous societies, we all, we all have these vision quests. Now keep in mind, first of all, the caveat here is like, when explorers came to this continent, they came to a continent that had 23 countries. There are 23 very distinct indigenous countries on this continent of North America, which includes Canada, by the way. Can Canadians are Americans as well, in North America. They're not US citizens, but they're, Can they're Americans, right? And they, we forget that. But um, and when they figure out what bacon really is, then we'll help them <laughs> along the way. Um, but when we look at sort of the, um, the issues of looking at these 23 countries, we all have different, we're very biologically different. We're different ethnicities. We're, we have different ceremonies. We have different food systems. We have different, different medicinal systems. We also have an ex extensive trade system. Well, when they came here and they started to look at some of the stuff that we had, they started, explorers being they, started to realize that there was, um, there were things happening in these systems that of um, sort of ceremony that were important to individuals, but not used among other tribes. And so, for instance, in Wabanaki, you know, uh, people of the Dawnland, people of the First Light societies and tribes that well, I'm from, and we exist now, now we were bigger uh, as far as scope goes, but we exist now in Maine, Quebec, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, PEI, Prince Edward Island, uh, and, um, Newfoundland, we exist in the whole, you know, Canadian Maritimes and Maine today, that our form of like 
uh, in sort of instilling, I'm not gonna quite get in deep enough into your question because it's another whole talk and it's a great question. Um, but we, we, we go through fasting ceremonies to elicit a response, to elicit that connection that may be psychologically changing us, that, that brings us to a vision, that brings us to a place that our bodies normally would not go to. And those vision quests usually are four days without food or water. So it's a, it's, it's a instilling a sort of a, a physiological reaction in your body by, con, by starving your body so you're able to connect with what we call the higher power. And so we don't have anything that we ingest that gets us to that point quickly. However, we do have ceremonies like the warrior ceremony uh, where some of our men and our women were warriors too. Uh, we were not exclusive. <laughs> men just didn't fight. Some of the, our best leaders into battle were women back in those days and probably still today. I, I know for a fact still today. And so um, we have these roots that we will take, that we'll drink out in these ceremonies. We'll boil it down and drink the, the um, product of that, which will make us throw up a lot to the point where we feel like we're going to die, which elicits a hallucinogenic response. And that gets us in touch with sort of thinking about our ancestors and what they want us to do and, and how they want us to react and how we need to react for our future. So again, I'm, I'm just like, we're in a mountain range and I'm just flying across, knocking snow off each one. I'm not getting into your mountain that you want to talk about. And we will talk more about through our lives, but um, there is sort of a way in which we do that. And um but we elicit our responses in that way through literally starvation. And so um, hopefully that superficially answers your question a little bit. So uh, right. where's the mic going next? Okay. Oh, okay. And then uh, somebody else. Thank you for sharing that story. I'm wondering whether Chagwala ever was asked questions or asked to tell a story that you didn't want to tell. So the way that that's a great question. And the way that the um, Chabalok always made the decisions on what story he wanted to tell. So he always went by responses of nature. And he always went by social and political climate to gauge what stories he was going to tell. So if we were in a battle or if we were we, we did battle um, the whole premise of the Wabanaki Confederation was to defend the tribes against the Mohawks who uh, were trying to gather flint because the word Mohawk refers to them as being flint gatherers from our sacred mountain called Kenio, which is in the lake called Moosehead Lake today. And it was an extensive trade item that we had. So we formed this confederation to defend ourselves against this invasion and attacks on our resources. And um, so Chabalok would talk about stories that had implications for war and outcome and encouraging and empowering our warriors, men and women alike, to be the best they could be. And to remember, you're going in there not on ego, you're going in there to uh, better the protection of all our people and our children who can't fight, and the elders too. And to keep our legacy going, keep us alive, and to do what's, what needed to be done as far as being right, and that's to protect all life ironically protect all life while we're taking life, right? That's the unfortunate part of it. So Chabalok always used that in natural climate actions to talk about floods or extreme winds. So we had stories about Wajelson, the wind bird, and why the wind gets mad crazy at times. And he would tell that story so we understand that it'll pass and we'll fix it. We'll fix what broke. And we don't question nature. Nature has a reason. And we must, as people, just go with that flow. He also told stories about floods and memories of floods and how to recognize that this might be coming so that you don't, so that you move away from potential danger physically uh, and not say, oh, it'll, it'll just flood, uh, you know, we'll be okay. And then you wake up in the middle of the night and you're floating down the river, you know, and that's not a good, that's not good. And so, um, he would always tell stories based around that. And if there were times where it was clear, calm, collected, then he would tell stories about 
the animals or uh, or just more stories that had morals, lessons, and values embedded in them, so that we could understand and be reinforced on that. Oh, show. Oh, that wasn't the oh wait. Oh, okay. I was so, sorry. Um, we'll we'll get back to you. And I have two kind of related questions. Okay. Um, a lot of my work is around what impact does storytelling have on our audiences, right? What, what, when you do storytelling work, what are the signals for you that this is doing the work that I want it to be doing or that the work it should be doing? And then the second question kind of related is, inclusive work is hard and it is exhausting and it is tiring. Are there examples that you can give us of like when you're, you know, your cup of chai was filled and you felt satisfied on the inside, something that made you feel like, it's struggling, it's, but it's worth doing the work that we're doing. Okay. Yep. So the first part of the question, how do I know, is it was, how do I know when I'm connecting? How, how do you know that, what are the signals that you see that your work, the work that you're doing is working? Yeah. So I, I watch my audience quite a bit. I look you in the eyes. You notice that? Um, I try to look everybody in the eye. Sometimes they're not even looking at me. I don't care. I'm looking at their eyes, looking at something else. Why they're looking at something else? I don't know. I'm up here, but you know, whatever. Um, so no, what I try to do is to try to see if I, I try to take the story from their minds and put it into their hearts. So I ask uh, earlier on. I used to when I when I teach. I, how do you guys envision the story? Was it live action, real people, real animals, things going on, or did you picture it like a cartoon? Was it a cartoon in your mind? And I can tell by looking around when I'm telling a story when I need to kind of, for myself, take a little step back from the message of the story, because I might be getting too much information out at once, or whether or not I'm actually communicating effectively, because when you're not communicating effectively, when you get bored, they're bored. And so I try to make sure that I'm not bored, that I'm always on top of what I'm trying to do. And I'll add things to a story. I'll never tell a story the same way twice. So I'll add something to the story specifically for that purpose. So it's really important for me to gauge the audience in that way. And then to realize that I can take a step back and take a break and, and then you see them relax a little bit too. And so the second part of your question was, yeah, so I, other moments when I'm satisfied, like I feel like it, my cup's been filled, is when um, I don't know that until after. And, and that's usually the feedback. So once I hear later on that this was like, I, I got this out of that story, or I got this out of that story, my goal is to tell the story to 100 people and have 100 different interpretations. I want everybody to own what they find important. I want everybody to seek in that story what's meaningful for them at that time and place. I don't want everybody to get the same message. I don't want anybody to focus on the same thing. Obviously, a few people will, but many won't. And that's when I, I know that I've done my job is to be available for other people to find, kind of put that story into something that they can relate to, both professionally or personally or within the parameters of their worldviews. Okay. Um, so I invite both of you to connect with John. Um, there's an invitation for me and Steve to connect with him. She's been connecting since I <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.